The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Center for State and Local Government Excellence webinar, Proactive Pension Management, an elected official's guide to variable benefit and contribution arrangements. Before we dive into uh, the details of, of uh, today's webinar, we want to walk through a few logistics. As you can see on the slide in front of you, uh, you're all in listen-only mode. Um, as we uh, go through our presentation and offer comments, we want to hear from you. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in on the right side of your screen in the uh, uh, attendee control panel. And what we'll do at the end of the uh, webinar, we will go to our Twitter uh, page, which is at 4GOVTExcellence, and we will answer uh, your questions and include the hashtag proactive pensions so we could uh, keep track of the questions and the answers. Also, we really appreciate all of you attending today's webinar. If any of your colleagues weren't able to join us today, we'll be offering a uh, recorded version on our YouTube page embedded into our website shortly after the webinar is completed. And if you have any technical issues while you're uh, on today, feel free to contact GoToWebinar Technical Assistance at the 1-800 number offered on your screen. So my name is Joshua Franzel, President and CEO of the Center for State and Local Government Excellence, and I'm really happy to have joining me today our Senior Research Associate, Gerald Young, our colleague from the University of Georgia, Paula Sanford, who's the Senior Public Service Associate at the Carl Vincent Institute of Government, and Anna Petrini, a Senior Policy Specialist of Environment, Labor, and Retirement Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Before we dive into the, the content of the report that we're gonna be talking about today, as many of you know on the call, our center has the overarching mission of helping promote excellence in state and local government so they can attract and retain talented public servants. We do this uh, through a variety of research and communications around retirement issues, demographic analyses, uh, health and wellness benefits, and more generally tracking workforce and labor force development best practices. So the conversation today uh, is going to focus on the uh, report on the right-hand side of your screen, an elected official's guide to variable benefit and contribution arrangements. It's, a, it's so far the second in a series. Uh, the, the first one we've, we've, we've done is on a guide for, for elected officials, understanding public pensions. For both of these, we work closely with AARP in developing these guides to help break down what can be rather complex topics around public pensions and variable contribution arrangements into more bite-sized pieces for, uh, for folks to understand. These guides, along with other center research, leverage a resource that we're quite proud of, uh, the public plans database, publicplansdata.org, uh, that we offer in um, coordination with the National Association of State Retirement Administrators and the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. It's a wealth of data on 180 plus plans around the country that represent over 95% of all public pension assets and members. And it really allows us to track the fiscal health and changes going on in the public pension uh, sector overall. So with all of that noted, I'd, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my colleague, Gerald Young, who will now walk us through some of the top level findings of the most recent report we released with AARP. Proactive Pension Management, Elected Officials Guide to Variable Benefit and Contribution Arrangements. Gerald? Yes, thank you, Josh. Uh, where I'd really like to start before getting into the uh, variable arrangements themselves is how most pension funds are structured at this time. Uh, the traditional way of structuring those plans has been as a defined benefit, uh, whereas uh, a benefit uh, or an annuity amount is promised to each uh, beneficiary based upon some predetermined formula, typically, uh, you know, either their uh, final wage or an average of their final wages over a period of time, multiplied by some uh, additional factor, uh, and uh, including in that uh, the years of service that they have put in for that uh, particular government. And 
the idea is that no matter what happens to the invested funds, the employee or the beneficiary is always made whole. So even if the pension fund loses money, uh, the benefit for that employee remains the same. The other model that is typically uh, considered is a little bit more the private sector model, the 401k style or defined contribution arrangement under which the employer or the pension plan uh, has a fixed amount that is provided to each annuitant and that amount is what is uh, unchanging but if the performance of the funds uh, is less than optimal uh, then the amount that the retiree is able to draw on later in life is reduced uh, likewise if the performance of those funds is better than anticipated uh, the annuitant might receive more of a benefit from that plan uh, those types of plans put more responsibility in the hands of the individuals uh, again the employees or the beneficiaries uh, to manage their own funds make decisions about uh, fund allocation within that larger retirement system uh, whereas the investment responsibility under a defined benefit program is either with the employer or with the fund administrators. Uh, and likewise, uh, you know, as both of those examples illustrated, the risk is either on the part of the pension plan itself or on the part of the employee, depending upon how that is structured. So with those as the starting point, variable structures uh, look at that a little bit differently. Uh, you know, again, as I said, the standard benefit plan might be that you look at the salary times the years of service times a multiplier, and that results in whatever the employee's retirement benefit would be. With a variable structure, next slide, please. A number of possible factors go into determining what the variable benefit or contribution might be. Now, there may also be some form of base benefit that is guaranteed, uh, but changes in that benefit or changes in the contribution would also come into play depending upon what happens with those various uh, factors. So taking one example, let's say the fund balance, uh, if the fund balance were to drop, and that could happen for multiple reasons, uh, very often based on investment returns, but it could also be based on uh, other uh, factors such as changes in actuarial uh, assumptions about uh, how long people are going to be living and how long they're going to be drawing down their benefits. Uh, if that fund balance were to drop, then potentially the variable benefit might drop as well. So again, there might be some guaranteed level of benefit, uh, but there might be a variable benefit such as a cost of living adjustment, and that might vary within a certain range. And if there's a drop in one factor, there might be a drop in that variable benefit. Uh, so as you look at the other possibilities, it also might be that rather than having the benefits drop and the benefits you know, again, or something that's typically paid out to the retiree, uh, it might also be that there's a change in the contribution. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, it might be that the, sorry, go back one, please. Uh, it might be that the fund balance has fallen uh, and therefore the contributions that are being made uh, possibly by the employee, possibly by the employer or some combination of the two uh, would increase to make up for the fact that the fund balance has fallen. Uh, when we talk about the fund balance falling, that's not necessarily an absolute. It's not, you know, if there's any negative change in the fund balance that the uh, contributions or the benefits would vary as well. But uh, there's quite a range of possible outcomes. And that's where uh, the next slide gives us a little bit better picture. Going back to about the year 2000 or so, most uh, public pension funds were at or near 100% funded, meaning that 
all of the projected payouts that they needed to make to their retirees. They had funds collected and ready to uh, make good on those promises. But as we had a, uh, a recession in the early 2000s, and then again after the, uh, 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 the housing bubble in 2008, uh, there were significant losses in a number of pension funds, uh, which were brought on by a couple of things. One was the investment experience uh, that they had invested in uh, items that did not bring in quite as much return as anticipated. Uh, and also there were some losses in terms of what those employers were contributing to those funds. Uh, it can be very tempting when there is a, uh, a drop in the economy to say, you know what, we are not going to uh, put in all of our actuarially determined contribution this year. Uh, we're gonna take a break. Uh, maybe we'll get back to that next year. Maybe we'll just pay half of that this year. Uh, but every time there is a decision to take a break in funding all that you should be funding, it impacts your performance down the road. And I think that can most clearly be seen in the next slide here. Looking at the assumptions in terms of investment earnings. And in the orange, you see uh, each of those investment earning uh, assumptions that went into each one of those years from 2001 to 2016. They look fairly uh, consistent from year to year. Actually, there has been some gradual change. Uh, but as you look, let's say, at the very middle of the graph, it's about a 7.9% return assumption uh, that was fairly consistent leading up to that point. Uh, and when we hit the recession, we had actually an 8.2% loss and then a 10.3% loss, two years in a row, significant losses, far below the 7.9% anticipation. So what that meant was that all of the principal uh, that should have been available for investment earnings was significantly degraded to the point that even when in 2010, things bounced back and the return rates were uh, once again, higher than the assumed returns. Uh, the principle was such that it took uh, quite some time for that to rebound. Uh, so as a matter of fact, as you look at 2016, we are now down to an average of, uh, next slide please, 7.25% um, as the assumed return rather than what had been basically 8%. Uh, so funds are making uh, you know, much more realistic assumptions in terms of what they can earn on their investments. Uh, they're certainly being cautious in terms of you know, past recessionary experiences or uh, potential renewed problems in the future. Uh, but with all of that, they're still looking at ways that they can make the best use of pensions as a tool not only to help their employees to retire and to retire with, um, you know, basically a living uh, wage that uh, will see them through that retirement, but also uh, looking at those pensions as a tool for recruiting and retaining a skilled workforce. And as you are competing with the private sector, particularly during this period of rather low unemployment, uh, pensions and other benefits paid by public sector employers are a significant draw for those who are looking at whether to go for a public or a private sector uh, position. And with that, they're also obviously trying to balance uh, not only those concerns, but also their own fiscal concerns in terms of budget and in terms of uh, you know, being flexible in terms of what they're contributing each year, what they are promising each year. Uh, and that's what brings us to this whole question of uh, variable uh, benefits or contributions. So as we look to the map on the next page here, this is not something that is new. In fact, some of the funds that we were looking at specifically in the case studies in this report uh, have had variable provisions in their pension systems for 20 years or more. Uh, but it's something that's really uh, experimented on by states around the country. 
everybody has a slightly different take on how they would like to implement variable benefits or contributions. Uh, in some cases, it's something that goes into effect automatically. In other cases, it might be something that requires some further action by the legislature, uh, but that's based on a formula or uh, a trigger that tells them that, hey, it might be time to make some change in the contributions or the benefits. So uh, this particular report, as I say, has looked at case studies uh, from six of the, those states. And uh, to get into two specific examples for you, I will at this point turn things over to Paula Sanford of the University of Georgia. Thanks, Gerald, and also thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today about two of the five case studies we researched for this guide. They are what you see first, South Dakota Retirement System, and secondly, the Virginia Retirement System. The reforms they adopted are rather different from each other and demonstrate the variety of approaches that can be undertaken to maintain a retirement plan that provides strong benefits with sustainable funding requirements. The first study of S with SCRS provides some basic information about its plan. As you can see, SCRS offers a defined benefit plan with a 1.8% multiplier based on the five-year final average salary compensation. The normal retirement age is 67 and the vesting period is three years. SDRS's plan is the largest in the state and serves state, local government, and school employees. The SDRS and South Dakota legislature have made full funding of the plan a priority for many years. So having it funded well above 90% is the norm. Of course, in 2018, you can see it was at 100%, which is the expectation. In fact, to reduce uh, or adjust for lower investment returns, the discount rate was recently decreased to 6.5%. Next slide, please. The reason why we chose SDRS for our report is its innovative cost of living adjustment. Prior to legislative changes in 2010, SCRS's retirement plan had statutorily fixed contribution rates, benefit formula, and COLA. The only flexibility in the plan was its amateurization, amateurization period, which could be infinite. In 2010, SDRS started researching reforms to the plan's design and worked with the legislature to pass legislation. The result was, was maintaining the benefit formula, fixed contribution rates for employees and employers, they now each pay 6%, but allowing flexibility with the COLA. The method the SDRS applies to determine the COLA level annually is shown in the slide. First, SDRS determines whether the plan would be 100% funded using a baseline COLA assumption of 2.25%, that blue box on the upper left. If it is, then the COLA will equal the CPI for urban wage workers, but within a range of half a percent to a maximum of 3.5%. If the initial COLA test does not result in full funding, then retirees receive a restricted COLA that would result in 100% funding for all future years. This restricted COLA would be less than the CPI, but retirees are guaranteed a minimum of a half a percent COLA. The likely result over the long term will be an average COLA that is slightly less than the CPI. The application of this variable COLA to current retirees has been upheld in courts. Next slide. There are some key takeaways that can be learned from SDRS's reform. First is that SDRS has maintained a very good relationship with the state legislature over the years. SDRS has always been forthright with its information and both the legislature and SDRS have been very thoughtful about the level of benefit offered and plan affordability. As such, 
the legislature unanimously approved the plan reforms at both the committee level and on the floor. Second, SDRS made a concerted effort to communicate with all stakeholders, current employees, employers, and retirees about the proposed plan changes and why they were needed for long-term sustainability. And finally, the reform reflects SDRS's belief that it has a fiduciary responsibility to all stakeholders and that no one group should subsidize another. This is why employers and employees equally contribute to the plan. Likewise, the flexible COLA limits current employees from paying higher contribution rates due to unfunded liabilities associated with retirees. Next slide. Now, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about the Virginia Retirement System, or VRS. VRS is also a multiple employer plan serving the state, local governments, and school districts. The plan we are discussing today went into effect in 2014 and also has a considerable amount of flexibility built into it. New employees participate in a hybrid plan which offers defined benefit and defined contribution elements. The DB portion is equal to the average five highest consecutive years of salary times 1%. The standard retirement age is based on the rule of 90, that is a combination of years and years of service and age equaling 90, or the age to receive unreduced social security. Retirees continue to receive a COLA on their defined benefit based on the CPI. Employees pay 4% of salaries, and employers pay the remaining actuarial determined contribution. This contribution rate flexibility for employers supports full funding for the DB portion of the plan. The plan also has two defined contribution components. One is a mandatory contribution of 1% from both the employee and the employer. This money is invested in a 401A cash match plan. The second is the 457 plan for voluntary employee contributions and includes the innovation of interest. Next slide, please. When creating the hybrid plan, the Virginia legislators wanted to encourage additional savings from employees. The mechanism they chose was automatic escalation of employee contributions within the 457 plan. With it, employee contributions are matched by employers, 100% for the first 1% of employee contributions, and at 50% for further employee contributions until the employee's contribution reaches 4%. So, and if an employee contributed 4% of salary to the 457 plan, the employer would also contribute 2.5%. To avoid employees from never increasing their initial contribution amount, every three years, VRS automatically raises each employee's contribution rate by half a percent until he or she reaches the 4%. Employer matching contributions continue with automatic escalation and well as well. Employees may opt out of the escalation though. BRS was one of the first public plans to adopt automatic escalation. The legislature debated how often the escalation should occur and at what amount, trying to balance the competing concerns of wanting employees to save, but not being so aggressive with the automatic escalation that employees would opt out of it. VRS applied the first round of automatic escalation in 2017, and it was extremely successful. 97% of all employees kept their higher, higher contribution rate. VRS Director Patricia Bridget attributes this to the high quality educational tools VRS offered to employers 
and the success of behavioral economics. Next slide, please. There are some key takeaways to be learned from VRS's new hybrid plan. The first is that automatic escalation and behavioral economic tools can work in the public sector. If you would like to learn more about these tools, SLGE has several resources on its website. The second is that high quality educational tools do work to improve savings. However, these should not only be communicated to employees. VRS worked with employers because they are often the first source of information about benefits. Employers were able to explain the importance of savings and automatic escalation directly to their own employees. VRS believes that the new hybrid plan has been successful at achieving the legislature's goals of improving overall retirement plan funding ratios and reducing employer contribution costs. I encourage you to read about the other variable plan innovations in the other three case studies as well. Next, you'll hear from Anna Petrini from the National Conference of State Legislatures to learn about its perspectives. Thank you, Paula. And thank you to the organizers for inviting NCSL to present here today. Um, next slide, please. My name is Anna Petrini, and I'm a senior policy specialist in the Labor Employment and Retirement Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. NCSL is a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff of the nation's 50 states, its commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, testimony, and opportunities for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. Today, I'll touch on the legislative opportunities and barriers to implementing variable benefit and contribution arrangements, one concern with these arrangements, and then the trends associated with their adoption. Uh, next slide, please. One opportunity that variable arrangements present is reducing uncertainty. Lawmakers are grateful for this in the budgeting sphere, but they also understand that benefit predictability can help with recruitment and retention of a skilled workforce, as we've discussed. Knowing how you're going to address market fluctuations in advance can help legislators design plans that protect and even enhance benefits. And these variable arrangements can draw on principles from behavioral economics, um, harnessing the power of inertia to help workers save more, as we talked about with the auto escalation feature in Virginia's hybrid. Eliminating rate uncertainty for employers can create more certainty for state budgeting, and in the end, this may be even more important than the actual dollar amount of the rate that's determined. Another opportunity associated with these variable structures is that once they're adopted, legislators and legislative staff members can redirect their time and expertise toward other policy areas. The flip side, of course, is that these arrangements tie legislators' hands. Though it should be mentioned this can also be politically expedient if lawmakers don't have to launch reform efforts in the most challenging political climate. Another challenge for legislators is assuring effective communication with stakeholders, both in the creation and the implementation of new variable arrangements. The alternative can mean that risk isn't apportioned fairly among various stakeholders, and legislatures may have to revisit reform efforts after their adoption. Uh, one final note here, it may be considerably more difficult to balance these risks in a sustainable way in politically charged environments or during economic crises. Next slide, please. One very significant change to public employee pension plans in recent years has been in the post-retirement benefit increase or cost of living adjustment uh, area. It's standard in public sector retirement plans to provide automatic cost of living adjustments to help preserve retired people's ability to cope with inflation. Um, these are very expensive benefits and a substantial number of states have postponed them, and in some cases canceled them, in others pinned them to funding levels in their retirement plans. This is an area where you see states creating contingencies that drive the implementation of a COLA. 
So you may have a delayed onset where retirees must reach a certain age in order to qualify for a COLA, or the COLA may be applied to only a portion of the benefit. Uh, it can be linked to investment performance or made contingent upon the actuarial soundness of the plan. Um, over the last 10 years, about 10 states have made changes that apply uh, only to future hires. Seven have made changes for active employees, and about 13 have made them for people who already retired, as well as those who will retire in the future. In a number of states, these changes have been challenged in the courts. Um, as far as the litigation is concerned, the lawsuits here can go in a lot of directions. So despite the efforts of legislative policymakers, court challenges may represent a sort of wild card in this space. This is also an uneven area of policy where some states have retained meaningful COLAs and some have, practically speaking, eliminated them. Um, arrangements like these run the chance of leaving retirees exposed to inflation risk when their earning power is drying up. Next slide, please. As far as trends go uh, with the adoption or potential rollback of these arrangements, the first few years after the Great Recession marked a very busy period for state legislation dealing with pensions, but things seem to have finally slowed down a bit. That said, 2017, 2018, and 2019 have seen some major reform efforts come to fruition, but far fewer uh, reforms since the period immediately following the Great Recession. Pension plan changes are increasingly yielding risk-sharing arrangements, including the sorts of variable benefit and contribution structures we've discussed today. Risk-sharing features allow participants to understand the rules in advance so they can anticipate the impact of risky events. It's uncertain whether legislators will leave the recent rash of reforms to play out or whether shifting economic and demographic trends will lead to an uptick in plan change legislation. But it will be interesting to see how new data tools um, such as stress testing affect policy in this area. While public plan actuaries have always done stress testing or similar types of modeling, formal legislative mandates for annual stress testing have gained some traction recently. In the end, there's no one size fits all recipe for sustainable retirement benefits, but variable arrangements can represent an innovative approach. Um, and with that, I'll turn things back over to Josh. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, we'd now like to um, move to the next slide and uh, remind you of our Twitter handle at 4GOVT Excellence. Um, what we're going to be doing is the questions that have come in throughout the course of today's webinar. We'll be answering them via our Twitter handle using the hashtag, hashtag uh, proactive pensions. Um, also, I want to take the opportunity just to remind those of you who are on the call today that might not be on our e-newsletter. If you go to slge.org and under about an events section, uh, there's the e-newsletter sign up feature. We'd love to have you join our e-newsletter, which would allow us to send you uh, reports and other communications related to upcoming research we have coming out. So with that, we'd like to thank you for, for joining us today. We'll be shifting over to our Twitter uh, handle now. And uh, please look uh, be on the lookout for future center research coming out in the next uh, few weeks, few months, and over the next year. So thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.